You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group. And co-hosts, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody, that rocking tune means it is time to rock out once again with everyone's favorite bi-weekly source for all things options-related. Yep, it's the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsider.com, as well as from the ever-exciting The Options Insider Radio Network, coming at you here early in 2020, early in this new year, this new decade of all sorts of market madness to unfold. Whither will it take us? Who knows? We can't see that far, but we can at least see what's going on today, and we'll help, we'll help navigate you through that morass. Instead, of course, as always, join us live Monday and Thursday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, or after the fact, on your device of choice. It's pretty much on every platform you could think of. And, of course, our app. I don't talk about our app that much. We have the app, of course, available for all the platforms. So if you want to get out of the Android or be out of the iOS ecosystem, sick of that Apple Podcasts, I get you. Grab the app. Of course, it works on Android as well and everywhere else. Get all of our shows, not just this one there. So that's a great place to go. If you'd like to go, if you'd like to go deep into the catalog, I know some people have written in just asking about that recently. That's a good place to go because you can get everything, no limitations, and no platform restrictions, none of that stuff. So dive deep on the app. And, of course, however you listen, live after the fact, hit us up, questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom we do enjoy hearing from you folks out there. Let's see who else I'm hearing from on the old all-star panel today. Let's go out first to a portion of the U.S. doesn't get a lot of love unless you're talking about option searches. Then it used to be number one. Now it is a, a paltry number two. Of course, to talk about Maine, the hinterlands, where we are joined once again by the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Line Capital. Mr. G, welcome back to the program, sir. It is, it is fantastic to be back. Fan, fantastic. As I sit here and I wait for some fills and bicks. Don't we all? We spend our lives waiting for fills. <laughs> Just sitting around <laughs> waiting for fills. What's the old uh, intro that old soap opera? Like the sands in the hourglass. Like, it's, it's like the ticks in VIX. So go the days of our lives here on the show. Let's turn out now to another quiet portion. A lot of quiet people. A lot of quiet portions of the U.S. joining us on the show today. To another little quiet portion outside of Chicago known as St. Charles. Where we are joined once again by Uncle Mike Tussaw. From St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program to you as well, sir. Always a pleasure to be here, especially when you got people waiting for the Ticks in VIX. <laughs> Love it. Waiting. What a great soap opera that would be, huh? The Ticks in VIX. <laughs> if Sibo <laughs> didn't sponsor that, they would be quite foolish. Speaking of foolishness, let's get to some as we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show where we talk about, surprise, surprise, what the heck is trading. And it's a robust start 
to the week out there for the Bulls. Markets were closing. Well, Dow touched an all-time high towards the end of last week. We're still off that level out there, but most of the markets are all still up and up pretty strong today. S&P up about half a percent is kind of the Goldilocks. Once again, out there, the Dow is a laggard up about a quarter of a percent. And the NASDAQ roaring on up, moving on up to the east side there, up 0.8% on the day. So a good day in tech-heavy NASDAQ land. I got a feeling where some of that's coming from. I think we'll get to that in a little bit. Gold and crude, at least in the form of WTI, taking a little bit of a break today. Gold at about 15, half again. So well shy of that 1600 level that broke when all the tumult over Iran first hit the tape. And WTI, well shy of that 60 level as well. That's about 5837 or so out there. A lot of stuff popping off. We'll get to all that. But first, let's get to what everyone else here has on their individual tapes. Let's start in the order we went. Let's start with the Rock Lobster, sir. What is lighting up your tape today, sir? Um, I just got filled. Can you hear me? I was ding-dinging here on the Tradehawk platform. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, ding, 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 the ticks ding, ding. and VIX have moved your way. <laughs> well, there was uh, 85000 offered, and I was the only bid a nickel away. And I finally got <laughs> You spooked them. You spooked that yes. 85000 with your 10 lots. I, I beat them into whacking my 10 <laughs> You're like, I'll see if that 85000 is real. I'll buy 10 <laughs> yes. Uh, like, oh, wait. Actually, I have to post something to our Vol newsletter right now because I'm I am putting on a, a May. I'm uh, sorry, a March Feb spread in in VIX. A let's just call it a um, a trade announcement uh, time spread. So we'll see how it all works out. Of course, you never know how it's all going to work out, but you try your hardest. Um, uh, and for me getting filled, though, too, just things like that, uh, I, I work things so I see when ball, the actual options are moving. Because sometimes um, VIX cash does not really give you the story. It's the futures that give you the story when you trade the ball products. So I, I want to see when the, the worm is turning and I set the trades up, usually uh, in the morning, depending on what's going on, and then try to fill throughout the day. So um it is, they are at a fillable level, but um, what is going on in VIX land? Will, my, will this trade phase one and all the good stuff that's coming out, a new thing just hit the tape, you know, they're going to take away the, or they're going to take away the manipulator status from the Chinese. Does, does this get us into the zone of the monk for vol? And does it stay there for a little while? Um, the NASDAQ clearly is in just in a la-la happy land place. You guys can talk about that later. But as far as VIX goes, uh, can we get the willing sellers of puts that is necessary to drive VIX to lower levels? Um, and 12 and a half, 12 is about the lows of the year. It doesn't really – it has a hard time uh, breaking through that, and it has not in 2019. And 2020 is a new year, but – um, I think you need you need to have a change in condition to get a change in ball, and a trade deal could get us into the eleven, you know, into the eleven handle. Which for people that watch VIX and the ball products and the potential split of reverse split of VXX and all that stuff um, is noteworthy. So there I am. I'm noting it. <laughs> I am noting it for everybody. Look at you trying to take advantage of that uh, juicy term structure out there. If you want to know what we're talking about, listeners, tune in to Vol Views. Hopefully you already have, and you can see exactly what we're talking about. A lot of spreads were lining up, playing uh, some of the, shall we say, the chasm, the gulf, the evolution going on between some of those futures, particularly in the front portion of the curve. Sounds like Mr. Rock Lobster a little bit enamored with that himself. Speaking of enamored, by the way, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm enamored with that, the ticks and vix. I'm amazed no one has taken that as like their handle on social media. There's no blog out there, the ticks and vix. People are missing out on a gold mine. What do you think, Mr. Rock Lobster? I, I think I should just. I think I should just start one. You know, Mark. Mark's going to do our huge uh, webinar tomorrow night, and maybe we'll have little offshoots for the baby VIX. We'll have the ticks in VIX. <laughs> you can't. If you can't see Mr. Sebastian, you could just. You could check out the ticks of VIX. Maybe a daily blog on what's happening, what's shaking. Um, I look at so much vol minutia that it probably would melt everybody's mind. But what the heck. Give them more. Give them the ticks and mix. I missed the chance. I've said it publicly now, so that URL is probably already, already gone. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, the fortunes we've let on the table. As we were sitting there watching the literal ticks and mix, we allowed a, a beautiful branding opportunity 
to slip through our fingers. You know who doesn't let opportunities slip through his fingers, though? It's Uncle Mike Tussaud. He's out there in St. Charles for a reason, listeners. He doesn't want to be distracted by the comings and goings of the big city. He needs to focus. He needs to focus on your money. And that's what he does out there in St. Charles. So Uncle Mike, sir, what are you focusing on today? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I was busy buying a, buying a domain name. Oh, oh geez, it's you. You're the one who scooped me, beat me to that punch, sir. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, so uh, I, I got to have a little bit of a disclo- disclaimer, disclosure before I say what I'm about to say. Um, we're right around the highs, and we did technically make new highs today, but we're not at them right now. So, um, But we're really close, and we have reached them today, so I can still say it. Never before in the history of the entire stock market has there ever been a better time to sell than uh, today. So we had new highs in the S&P today, so that's always an exciting thing. Uh, if it just does this every day for the rest of all of our lives, then uh, everything will be easy for us bulls. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way, so make sure that you have a plan, listeners, uh, in case we do start to come down a little bit. Uh, so in terms of things that are catching my eye right now, I know we have the financials coming up with earnings in the next few week, next week or two. Uh, so that's something that I'm definitely going to be watching, not trying to steal the thunder of around the block, but that is going to be a pretty big thing for this market. Uh, watching how uh, silver's holding relatively steady now that we don't think that we're going to be going to any major war in the near future. So that's a good thing for uh, those of us who are in sil- have silver exposure. And uh, just in looking at the ticks and VIX, uh, man, it's hard not to say that. So fun. Uh, we're still around the 12 and a half mark. And so um, market appears to be saying that, uh, yes, we are at all time highs. Uh or the VIX appears to be saying, yes, we are at all-time highs, but there is a little bit of concern from the standpoint that we're not in single digits right now, even after a 30% up year uh, just this past year. And so what the concern is, of course, uh, is the China deal going to actually happen? Um, Are we going to go to war with Iran? A lot of macro things. And of course, we have earnings coming up. So with that, uh, we're not in the single-digit VIX by any means, or the ticks and VIX are not in single digits. <laughs> that was fun to say. Uh, but when looking at this, uh, I think that I don't really see us going that much lower in VIX. Now, if we do go to the 11 zone, is area, 11 area, like Andrew was saying, um, we're still not at the single-digit levels as we once were uh, a couple of years ago, back when we were saying Donald Trump is definitely not a single-digit VIX president. So I think that uh, the, the VIX is a really big thing to watch at this point uh, when we are at these new all-time highs. Now, the next thing that we are looking at, of course, uh, would be at the Dow at the 30,000 level. Uh, we're roughly 120 points away from it at this point in time. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, like, People who really are in the markets and really trade a lot of times don't look at the Dow per se, uh, more, more along the lines of how I know the three of us anyway are more partial to looking at the S&P. Uh, but the Dow at 30,000 is definitely a big mental number uh, that we are approaching at this point in time. And if we cross it, I do think that could mean a lot of good things for the market in and of itself. Uh, now, with that being said, of course, uh, the Dow isn't the in thing in and of itself with the market, but uh, that is a big thing. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, I'll never forget I was in college when the Dow went over 10,000 and how big of a deal that was. Uh, same thing can hold true at the 30,000 level with the Dow. Uh, now, going, going onward to the S&P, uh, with that, we are approaching the 3,300 mark. Uh, so we're definitely hitting another uh, 100 mark in that on that index. But the other thing to think about with the S&P is that, uh, and I've talked about this on the show, is that the more the S&P goes higher, the less of a difference a 10-point move makes. 10 points used to be a huge deal on the S&P, uh, nearly 1%, but now that becomes more of a 30-point move. Uh, to closer to a 30-point move to get a 1%, actually more than a 30-point move to get a 1% move in the S&P. So as we go higher, uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, if these point movements can continue to go higher along with the percentage or if we'll have smaller movements or just be interesting to see how the market reacts to what's going to be happening over the course of the next few months. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to be a real um, gappy market because uh, we've had those in the past to where uh, the market does hardly any movement at all during the day, but then overnight is when most of the movement actually happens. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll wait and see to see where we go with it. A lot of excitement going on. 
A lot of excitement indeed, sir. Let's see what's lighting up the broad tape out there. Coming into the trading block here, we saw VIX at about a 12 half or so, a little bit north of that. That puts it off a little bit more than a third of a point from where it was this time last year. Our old friend VIX hovering right around the 89, a little bit shy of that, 88.9. That puts it down about half a handle from our last show. And our old friend VXX was hovering a little bit shy of the 14 handle, about 13.9. That puts it off about half a handle out there as well. In terms of what's lighting it up, Kind of an interesting day out there because we just talked about the indices kind of all doing their own thing today. And that's the case on the volume front as well. You go out to the vol space where we like to start, not a heck of a lot lighting it up. The ADV is about 420,000. We're seeing about half of that, 220,000 on the tape right now. So not a rock'em, sock'em robot day, not a quiet day, kind of in between uh, out there. But SPY blowing the doors off out there today. The ADV is about 2.6 million, almost hit that, a little over 2 million already on the tape. As we're coming into the trading block, so someone trading up out there and spy similar deal out there in the S, about two thirds of their ADV uh, on the tape right now. With the ADVs about one point two million, about eight hundred thousand on the tape out there, a little bit north of that out there right now. So pretty active day in the S as well. The Qs similar deal. Nasdaq obviously moving quite a bit today, four hundred twenty thousand contracts on the tape as of right now. The ADV about five hundred forty thousand out there. The Russells where we're seeing a little bit of quietness out there, the hundred thirty thousand contracts on the tape, the ADV about two hundred and ninety thousand contracts. Let's move on out to the most actives in the single name, the equity options out there. Cost you hundred twenty three thousand contracts to break into the top ten today. That would get you to Bank of America land. That's one hundred twenty three thousand contracts. Number nine, Roku. A perennial top tenner in there once again. Set top boxes. Who knew? I finally got my first Roku device over the holiday season. I've been hearing about them forever. Never actually had one, and they are pretty interesting. I haven't used it too much yet, but so far, I can maybe see what the hubbub is about. Maybe not the volatility of the volume, but I can see what the interest is about, perhaps. Uh, number eight, we've got, I do believe this is this is a newcomer to the top ten. I haven't seen this one in there in some time. This is, oh, this is our old friend. That's right. <laughs> this is Canopy. This haven't been in the top 10 options volume in a while. Good old Canopy Growth, uh, ticker symbol CGC. 139,000 contracts on the tape out there. That's actually pretty robust out there for CGC. Let's go out here really quick and see what the ADV is out here in Canopy. That's only, it's only 56,000, so they've already done, closing in on 3X that already today. So something is afoot out there in good old canopy growth today. In fact, stock's up 10% because that's a given. That's that's a day that ends in Y <laughs> out in canopy uh, out there. Uh, interesting stuff. Let me just look really quickly. Uh, 14,000 of the Jan 22 halves is the big print out there in canopy. And the stock's trading about a little bit around 22 half, around 22, 22 and 66 or so. So at the money, Jan calls leading the tape out there. Interesting. Move on to number seven, AMD, 163,000 contracts on the tape. Number six, Baba. Going back out to uh, China, 174,000. Number five, Facebook, a buck 97 on the tape. Number four, Beyond. They have false faux meat fame. Of course, Impossible making a lot of headlines of late with their new faux pork. Beyond, maybe riding that wave. I heard some people speculating maybe there's a bit of a short squeeze going on in Beyond. I'm not sure what's driving it, by the way. Beyond moving, uh, 205,000. Maybe they have a pork alternative of their own. Ready up their sleeve. Who knows? Either way, 205,000 contracts on the tape and beyond right now. Number three, good old ABBV. Haven't talked about that one in a while. 219,000 contracts on the tape. Number two, a name that is used to being the king of the ring, but not today. 478,000 gets you to number two for Apple. And number one with a bullet. I think you can guess where I'm going, listeners. Freaking Tesla just on fire out there. 541,000 contracts on the tape, that's up over 8%. Uh, that puts the stock pretty much at an all-time high. It was at about 517. Let's see where it is right this moment, listeners. Yes, 519 now, 519 and a half. That's a new all-time high. This is on the heels of more analyst love out there, an analyst, I believe, from Oppenheimer coming out and deciding he's uh, got the love for Tesla raising his 12-month price target and uh, making all sorts of Fun analyst comments about their risk tolerance ability to implement learnings, plural, from past errors. <laughs> I like that. So, analyst comments always bring a smile to my face, usually because they're such nonsense. But either way, people are buying it to the tune of up 41 handles. That means the stock is pretty much doubled, up 108% 
just in the past three months. So Tesla, I think the technical term is on freaking fire. Well past 100 handles now north of that 420 takeout level that Musk was in so much trouble for not too long ago. Also, interesting timing for this because a lot of the things that have been driving Tesla have been coming out of China. The news out of the Chinese auto market today, not so good. Kind of grim, actually. They're saying it's probably going to be slowing down over there. And yet uh, Tesla off to the races. So a day that ends in Y. Tesla lighting it up out there. Mr. Rock Lobster, I know we chatted about it before. It's been a little while. The crazies out there in the pit chat while they're gearing up for your big webinar tomorrow. Are they, are they slinging a lot of Tesla these days, sir? Uh, they were slinging some uh, like 500-level butterflies, and I actually think they're closing some of them. Uh, when, that, when we got to chat and that 500 was that targety thing, um, I think flies they bought for a buck, they, they're closing for four bucks. So... Uh, because the upside curve skewy part is, uh, you know, was pretty, it was pretty big. So uh, it made for very inexpensive flies. Uh, I think Mark looked at one in our Friday, uh, in our option pitch on Friday. So inexpensive, um, inexpensive upside. That's <laughs> you, you put on a fly and you get a lot of bang for your buck um, in the crazy land of Tesla, but. Uh, it's, uh, I guess they're taking over the car business. Apparently. Uh, yeah, I like that. Get a lot of bang for your one buck flies out there in Tesla land. Getting, sounds like four bucks for your one buck fly out there in Tesla land. Good juice to be found. That's people, yeah, that's sometimes counterintuitive for people. Sometimes when the skew gets wonky, they think, oh, these flies are going to be extremely expensive, but not the case out there, which is kind of interesting. Let's move on to what else is interesting. If you're saying, hey, I need some more micro in my in my ear holes these days. I'm tired of all this crazy macro, will they, won't they, saber rattling, who did what on the broad macro perspective. Give me some, some numbers I can sink my teeth into. You'll be happy because we're back in it, listeners. We're back in the old earnings front uh, kicking off this week with a lot of the financials. Hope you like some financials. Tuesday, we've got J.P. Morgan Chase, City and Wells Fargo, as well as Delta Airlines. Wednesday, Bank of America, Goldman, BlackRock, PNC, U.S. Bank Corp., and good old Alcoa. Alcoa used to be the kickoff. Now, they've kind of been bumped into the rear view. Who, who needs to look at aluminum, or as the Brits like to say, aluminium, <laughs> uh, anymore out there to see where the, where the earnings season is heading. Thursday, BNY, Mellon, Morgan Stanley, and Schwab, and soon maybe soon to be Schwab TD, whatever they're going to call that monstrosity. And Friday, we've got State Street and Citizens Financial. So if you like financials, you got a lot in store for you. Also a lot in store for you over there at theoptionsinsider.com. All the earnings movie reports coming in at you. Hot and heavy out there. we got some reports. Let's pull off another one here right now. Let's go, let's go to Wells Fargo. They've had some fame slash infamy over the past couple of years. Let's see what they're up to these days. According to this earnings movie report, the stock at the time was about fifty two sixty six. They were pricing in a whopping ninety eight cents, and in the past they've moved to buck six. So it seems like they're pretty much in line with past movements out there. Let's look for, let's see if anything is particularly outlandish. You talked about looks like actually PNC might be kind of interesting. PNC is at about almost one fifty nine out there at the time of this report. They were pricing in about three dollars and fifteen cents, which is pretty rich, especially considering their last. I shouldn't say their last. Their kind of aggregate moves in the past have been about two dollars and thirty one cents. So. Perhaps a little bit rich, perhaps some opportunities there. You can check these these names and many more out for yourself over there, theoptionsider.com. Click on the earnings move reports. Soon we're going to have some more earnings move results reports as well, so we can break down how all these names fared. Speaking of how things fared, let's see how the market is faring with some weirdness. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron has in store for us today as we keep on rolling into the odd block. Time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. Time to get wild, time to get weird. Also, time to p- go back into the Wayback Machine. Mr. Rock Lobster, are you ready to go back and pay off some more of these trades we've been watching, sir? Are you psyched? Are you fired up? I, I, am, I am as excited as I can be. I just filled a couple things. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm rolling out of one thing and into another. So would you say the ticks and vicks are rolling your way, sir? Um, the ticks and vicks are, 
you know, I, I try to get rid of my shorts as the ball goes down and roll into some long, slowly but surely. And um, that's kind of what's going. The ticks and vicks are rolling my way. I kind of say collectively I'm disappointed in all of us. It took us this long to come around to something as awesome as the ticks and vicks. <laughs> as, the, as the chief branding guy here on the show, I'll take most of that blame myself. But still, nonetheless, it took us a while, but we got there, listeners. So you're welcome. Uh, speaking of your welcome, let's see what else maybe you want to be thankful for here on the show. Let's find out. Maybe our traders will be thankful. Maybe not. First off, we're going to set the dial on the Wayback Machine all the way back to November 7th. So a couple months back here. Going to go out to Kohl's again. Ticker symbol KISS. K-S-S. What a cute ticker. Uh, they're trading. Well, actually, I won't tell you where they're trading right now because it's kind of a bit of a spoiler when we're doing these lookbacks. We'll find out together. Uh, at the time, listeners, we profiled... What was, looks like at the time, some, it seemed like some pretty meaty, pretty beefy Mr. Rock Lobster put love to the tune of the Jan 60 puts going up 10,750 times for $6.75. It did seem like these might be earnings motivated because there were some earnings coming up in a couple of weeks later. The earnings were on the 19th of November, so it seemed like there might have been uh, some earnings earnings playing out there. Let's look at the chart here and see. At the time, this went up November 7th. The stock was at 56.74, and it looks like it peaked out right before the earnings because coming in the next week on the 19th, it was trading 47.02. So perhaps this guy was right to be concerned here and right now the stock at forty six thirty five, so it hasn't really recovered from the sell off it had on the earnings. Now you might say at first blush, this guy probably did all right. He bought these fairly meaty puts. They were in the money at the time, and even more in the money after 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 the trade went up. And yet, uh, interesting and also worth noting, kind of reinforcing that these were earnings trades. Actually, kind of weird timing actually because. Maybe this is more of a rock lobster thing, because I know you like taking off your trades ahead of the earnings. Looks like our friend here put these on a total of about 11,000, so a couple hundred more total on the day, traded on the 7th. And then it seems like they pretty much took most of these off, took half of them off, 5,500 on the 15th, so before the earnings, for 475. So it seems like he lost a couple of bucks on those bad boys, uh, which is not good, obviously. And then looks like he took off their other half, 5500 a few days later on the 18th, still right before the earnings. Kind of interesting. Interesting time. He did those also, looks like, for a loser as well. They're, they were it was like around 525 when he closed them out, so lost a buck 50 there. So not exactly, not exactly good, good, good returns here for this guy, losing a couple of bucks close to it. Uh, 10,000, almost 11,000, actually about 11,000 times here. So Mr. Rock Lobster, a lot of puzzling head-scratching going on here. These are not open anymore. Uh, the, this, the OI is pretty negligible on these strikes. So it looks like our friend here put on these bad boys about 11,000 times, Mr. Rock Lobster. Meaty in the money puts. Looks like he was probably buying them. Looks like this print wasn't late, so it seems like this, this uh, print could be seen for what it was. And then he did it before earnings. And then took them off pretty soon before the earnings, actually. The earnings were on the 19th. Took them off on the 15th for a $2 loss. And took the rest off, the other half off, on the 18th for a buck, a buck and a half loss. Kind of head-scratching, Mr. Rock Lobster. You think if you buy meaty in-the-money puts, you're probably worried about the event itself, right? In which case, you probably want that protection through the event. We always counsel to avoid the event. But in this case, it seems like our friends wanted it. Uh, what's your take on this kind of weird trade and how it played out, sir? Um, I'm definitely seeing weird on this. I don't, uh, you know, somebody's just buying in the money puts like that. There's still 1,200 left open, it looks like. Um, it looks like, and then there's open interest down to 57 and a half and the 55s. You think they rolled them? I, I'm not I'm not sure on this one, Mark. Um You know, when you buy those big, juicy puts, you're looking for the stock to fall apart. And then, as we all know, through most of December, (laughs) pretty disappointing month for people buying in the money puts. Yeah. A lot of stuff. So, (laughs) you know, it just didn't work out that great. Um, 
So I, I guess all I would say on that score is, you know, it didn't work out that great. Um, I mean, if he held them, he or she, he or she, I guess we could say it. We could say they. Um, if they held them, uh, they would have made some money. But it, it looks like they got rid of most of them already. Yeah, they went to all the trouble of buying these extremely expensive puts right before earnings. And then they dump them all for, it looks like an average about a buck 75 loser. So let's just round it up, say a buck 75 uh, on the, on the 11,000 that they bought. So you're talking nearly 2 million bucks that they hemorrhaged on this trade. And then they didn't even keep it on through the period where you might expect to experience the significant sell off that you need to make these things pay off. Uh, so yeah, this would, even if they did roll them, they, they took a huge hit on the ones they opened up just over the course of a couple of weeks here, not even a week and change. So yeah, this one, this one, this one files for me as, Extremely weird. Obviously, the Jan contracts are still open. Not a lot left on this strike. So, uh, so I think we can put the, put the pin in this one and say weird and probably lost about $2 million. Uh So, yeah, not uh, – this one was a head-scratcher when we saw it because the use case of buying such meaty puts is usually very strange. Usually it means someone swinging for the fences on the downside or they're very concerned about a near-term, very downside event. And yet this guy took them off before the big event. Weird. All across the board. So file that one in the way. Hey, we don't call it the odd block for nothing, listener. Let's go on to let's go on to another review. This time we're going on out to our old friend. This this time we're setting the way back machine to October seventeenth. So going back almost another another additional month from that November seventh trade. To old friend hasn't talked about in a little while, but this it's popped up on our radar multiple times. This is old Malincrot. PLC, this is an Irish tax registered pharmaceutical company trading. Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> At the time, back on October 17th, ticker symbol MN, MNK, by the way, listeners, 13,173 of the Jan $4 puts, obviously, this is the cheapie, went up for $2.14, pretty much half the value <laughs> of the stock. Uh, well, actually, at the time it was it was almost the entirety of the value of the stock. We'll get to that in a second as well. Went up for two fourteen, pretty much lifting the offer thirteen thousand times and change. Total of sixteen thousand traded on the day. The stock price on the day of the trade two fifty five. <laughs> so that was that was a conversation on the day we analyzed this. Is would you go out and pay effectively almost the price of the stock for some puts on said stock and that, that expire in January? It seemed like an odd choice. Uh, the stock today, it, actually, this guy was gobbling up these puts. Stock has not been his friend, unless he's, he's of course, an underlying holder, probably, in which case maybe he is happy, but still, uh, not, not enough to offset these, these puts. The stock's up 80 cents. It's at 335. It's up exactly 80 cents from where it was on the day of the trade here. So, <laughs> has not been his friend. Go figure. These bad boys are still open to the tune of 19,000 are still open on this strike right now. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, options positions out here in Malincrot. So, Mr. Rock Lobster, this one seems like a bit of a loser here <laughs> as well uh, to be charitable. Obviously, Jan puts are still open. Anything could happen. The stock could plummet into the toilet. But as of right now, with about a week and change left to go. Eh. Not looking, not looking uh, too good here. Not even a week and change. We got you know <laughs> end of this week pretty much uh, to go. What you taking on this one? It's another kind of weird meaty put. The use case for it was kind of weird. Uh, we even went back after this review to see if maybe there was some funky box going up or anything like that. None of that. It's just straight up meaty put love. And then uh, they're kind of wearing it now, Mister Rock Lobster, to the tune of the stock. About 80 cents in their face. What do you think on these ones? Yet another use case for meaty puts. Not exactly working out in your favor, sir. All I know is we've named two blogs today. We've made, what was it? Uh, Vix, Ticks and Vix? <laughs> Vix Ticks. Ticks, the ticks, the ticks of Vix. Of Vix. And meaty put love. <laughs> <laughs> that might get some interesting traffic that maybe you weren't planning on when you... Uh... I, uh, all of a sudden... Jacrati just lost her mind because you guys lost your, your PG rating. <laughs> Here we go. iTunes rating gone. Our producer's up in arms at the Rock Lobster. <laughs> What's going on? Um, this put, again, we we weren't thrilled with this one. 
it was the use case was hard to make on this. You know, buying that, you know, buying a two dollar put in a four dollar stock. What the heck? Um, is it going to zero? I just it's just confusing. You know, sometimes when you can't figure out how it's supposed to make money, you can't figure out how it's supposed to make money. Uh, just difficult. So um, I, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> to be honest, I just don't know. So um, and, and that's where I am. On to be honest, I just I don't know what they're doing, and they're going to have to hold on to it for another three days. And it just you know, unless they're long a ton of stock. Um, and even then, because they're creating a synthetic call on the four strike, they're just, I don't see how they're getting any love on this as of right now. Um, but, you know, we could be wrong. We've been wrong in the past, but I don't, I don't think we're going to be wrong on this one. Yeah, things are trading about 66 cents <laughs> right now, uh, which is uh, still kind of meaty, but nowhere near the 214 that our friend paid. So another size loser listeners for some in the money puts again anything that happened towards the end of the week but it always seems like a shall we say dubious play when you're pretty much paying almost the entirety of the value of a stock for an option that expires in a couple of months that's usually usually a dubious choice all right let's let's wrap it up with a with an actual one coming in today from our eye of sauron let's go out i believe this might be a newcomer to our little band of fun here. This is First Horizon National Corp. It's a bank holding company, ticker symbol FHN, trading right now $16.15. This is the name that's had an interesting journey over the course of the past year. It's not a biotech by any means, but it's been moving a bit. A year ago, it was trading about a little bit less than two bucks shy of where it is right now, about fourteen thirty. And then it peaked out towards the end of the year at about seventeen forty. That was on November 5th. Of last year, and right now it's a little bit shy of that. It's at about 16 to 15, and it's had some interesting peaks and troughs along the way. It rallies, it sells off, it rallies, it kind of sells off. It's been mostly in the upward direction, but it has a lot of peaks and troughs along the way there, which is kind of interesting for a small bank holding corp. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron discovered today. It's the Feb 20s, or excuse me, the Feb 17s, expiring on the 20th, going up for 20 cents, a lot of 20s. <laughs> in this one today. This is lifting the offer. These were a dime at 20 cents. This is opening over there on the Philly. Went up 2,500 times. So the 17 strike, this is aggressive, but not exactly a bridge too far. It traded 1740 not too long ago. So it can retrace those levels, and it's going to have to do so in fairly short order for this 20 cents to not start evaporating Pretty quickly. Mr. Rock Lobster, we're wrapping it up here with kind of an old school odd block staple, the near term upside call love. This time in First Horizon National Corp. What's your spidey sense telling you about these ones, sir? Um, you look at this, you go, uh, okay. Uh, what is it? Some bank stock? Bank stock takeover, blah, blah, blah. I don't even see a whole lot of open interest on this anymore uh, on this strike, unless I'm, I'm just trying to. Look at my my platform here. Um, as of right now, it just doesn't seem like they're getting a lot of love at all on it. Um, but it, it could that could change. Love could happen. Love could be in the air. But um, as of right now, um, banks don't usually move a whole lot unless they get bought out. So um, yeah, I don't know how many bank stocks you traded back in the day, but all I know is I, I always ended up buying a lot of calls in those things. Just because people constantly writing them, just writing, 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 writing. So um, uh, that, but may, maybe they could get lucky here. We could give them luck is always possible. Words to live by from the Rock Lobster: Luck is always possible, and love could come. You never know when love could strike. So words to live by. You know what that means, Mister Rock Lobster. We paid off a couple. That means you might have to add these ones in our to be watch. I hate to grow it. Our cup overfloweth already. We'll keep an eye on these uh, these twenty cent flyers. See how our friend fares. Meanwhile, it's Monday. You know what that means it's time for a little bit of the old strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right, listeners, it's Monday. It's time for Uncle Mike to come on down from on high. Stone tablets and options, wit and or wisdom 
in hand. And, you know, Uncle Mike, people don't, don't often put it this way, but options at the end of the day, they are indeed assets. And when you have assets, sometimes it may behoove you to allocate them in perhaps a orderly fashion. If I was so inclined to do so, sir, with my options assets, how should I go about it? Well, let me tell you how I do it. Uh, the reason this comes to mind right now is because I'm doing annual reviews with all my clients. Uh, yeah, I, I, use, I do those in January, typically. I mean, so, typically there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, I'll do my annual reviews with clients in January. And uh, it's kind of fresh on my mind right now, uh, just because of the fact that uh, sometimes you need to reallocate. Uh, sometimes if you have a really good year in one thing, you want to keep your percentages and uh, keep things in line for the long term. So let's go through asset allocation today. I first want to do this. Now, brace yourself. I'm just doing this for purpose of example, but I am going somewhere with this, guys. I know you're going to scream when I say this. Let's pretend you don't have any options in your portfolio just to start with, okay? Okay. All right, cool. And so either either the, either uh, Mark and Andrew, or I'm sorry, if uh, yeah, Mark and Andrew either killed themselves right now silently, or they're 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 listening, or they're getting really mad from me even mentioning such a thing on this show. But the traditional model of asset allocation for financial advisors, uh, it's usually along the lines of the percentage with your age. So in other words, you take whatever your age is, and that's the percentage of your assets that you should have in something with. Uh, very minimal risk. So for example, let's say that you're 50, then you should have roughly 50% of your net worth in something that is low risk and the other 50% of your net worth into something that is uh, having some risk on it. So for example, a uh, very oversimplified example, 50% of your risk could be in stocks and the other 50% of your lower risk could be in bonds. Uh, uh, very uh, lower yield, um, Bonds, maybe government bonds, maybe a little bit of uh, corporates, whatever the case may be. But ultimately, the age is the percentage that a lot of advisors, and myself included, typically go by. Now, with that, what if you trade options? That can kind of make things a little bit uh, more complex. So what I like to do with my clients is I like to keep them uh, within that model, uh, but I like to use certain option strategies as I'll consider either more risk or less risk. So, for example, and once again, just to give you an idea of why you use this age model, the older you are, the lower your risk percentage is. So let's say you're 80 years old, then 80% of your assets are going to be in something with little to no risk, and then only 20% of your assets are going to be into something with risk in it. Of course, if you're 20 years old, then 80% of your assets can be in risk because you have more time till retirement. Uh, and more time to recover if something bad happens, so to speak. Now, how do I use that model with options? Let's assume that we have a 50-year-old client, uh, just to, for the sake of easy math, to make an illustration for this show. Well, what I like to do is certain option strategies I consider more low risk. So, for example, uh, my silver collars, uh, those are definitely in the lower risk section of the portfolio, meaning that when I'm trying to take advantage of the volatility skew or the reverse volatility skew, whatever way you want to look at it, uh, in silver, then I kind of consider that more of a low risk strategy. Now, I know if you talk to a regulator or talk to an auditor, because, well, believe me, I've talked to them about this before, uh, they might say, options, those are risky. Those should never be on the low risk side of it. Well, not so fast. You have to be able to explain yourself, which I have. I've literally testified on Wall Street. I'm not kidding on this one. Um, but with that, if you have a strategy to where, let's say that you're buying an at-the-money put, buying the underlying, and then selling an out-of-the-money call at essentially a zero-cost collar, you're looking to make between, say, zero and 5%. Uh, I've talked about my SKU fund before. Uh, for larger net worth clients that are looking for trades like that, um, I've literally, it, it's, it's always an interesting conversation. Uh, and they'll say, well, what do you recommend for something low risk? Well, how about Google? And then they laugh at me real quick. Then I explain to them the, them the SKU that exists. I'm not sure how much it exists anymore. I'm not uh, in the same trade anymore. Uh, but for example, when uh, the calls are more expensive than the puts, and you can essentially set up a trade to where the client's going to make between zero and five percent over the course of a year, well, how can you make it? So how can you guarantee not to lose money because of the fact that uh, that's just that's horrible? Well, no, I can to some extent. I'll never say the guarantee word ever. Uh, oops, I just said it. 
I'll never say it from the standpoint that, of course, the stock market could um, cease to exist as we know it. Uh, the brokerage firm could go bankrupt beyond uh, SIPC. Or, I mean, you have those catastrophic events, but you don't have market risk when you set up a zero-cost collar. So that's why I would put that on the little-to-no-risk side of the equation. Now, something that I would put on the higher-risk side of the equation uh, would be along the lines of just saying that you're owning underlying. If you own underlying, and of course that can go to zero, you have the fluctuation of the market, it could go up, it could go down, uh, you have that. And by underlying, I'm referring to stocks. Uh, you, you could, in theory, have like a bond ETF that uh, those I actually have put on the, the lower risk side of the equation. But um, stocks or stock-based ETFs or mutual funds, if you have those, I don't have any stock-based mutual funds. Uh, those would be on the higher risk side of it because they have market risk. Uh, also, covered calls. I believe that covered calls belong on the higher risk side of it, uh, not quite on the highest part of it, but kind of along the scale to where it's not fully over to one side, just kind of more towards the middle, because you do have a little bit less volatility with a covered call or a cash-secured put. Uh, Keep in mind, uh, yes, you can weather some volatility in a downturn if you have a covered call uh, or a cash-secured put for that matter. But remember, the protection side that exists on a covered call, it's a Band-Aid, meaning that if you sold a call for a dollar on a stock that's $50 a share and the stock goes down a dollar, well, that's a paper cut in the stock. And that Band-Aid does really well for your paper cut because you have that premium that's yours to keep. However, if the stock goes from 50 to 20, that's a severed jugular, and the Band-Aids don't do very well with severed jugulars. So I still think it's on the more higher risk side of the equation, but there's definitely less risk involved because of the fact that you are collecting that premium. Uh, let's say that you're buying options. Uh, you're selling leveraged spreads. Those would be in the riskier side of the equation, uh, but they're about as far over as they can be because you're using leverage. Uh, so those would be ones that would be on the risk side of the equation. Let's say that you are <clears throat> doing like a simulated index concept to where maybe you're in a bond fund and maybe with maybe 2 to 4% of the money that you have allocated for bonds, you maybe buy a couple of calls. Uh, and you want to do that as a way of maybe juicing up some yield in that or something along those lines or maybe selling some put spreads on the bonds or something like that. If you're doing that, I would still consider that part of the lower risk side of it so long as you have it combined with something else that would be considered less risk. So where I'm going with this is that options do play a major part in my asset allocation with which I do for clients. And I have a lot of very deep models that I go through with clients uh, every year. That's what we're going through right now in January. January is an extremely busy month for me. Uh, December and January, for that matter, uh, are extremely busy because of annual reviews. That's why you guys heard me on the road a lot. And that's one of the reasons, uh, just my busyness, uh, I was on the road a lot in December. And so uh, when you go through this and you actually uh, do proper asset allocation to where option strategies can fit within the overall portfolio, uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's very time consuming for me, but I think it's a ton of fun. And it's one where if you have your risk profile set up in the right way, you can really take a lot of advantage of what there is to offer in the option product. Uh, if you're just trading options and you're saying, oh, this is a way I can make some cash, that's fine. And I'm all for that. But if you don't have options in your longer-term portfolio using some of these strategies in certain ways, uh, folks, you are totally missing the boat on this. You're, you, there's a whole world out there uh, that I expose my clients to of how options can be used to help them sleep at night, to give them the risk with which they want to get them. And it's something to where you can customize your own risk. Uh, my clients, sometimes they make money, sometimes they lose money, of course, like anyone. I've never denied that ever. But I very seldom have I ever, I don't think I ever have, in the over 10 years I've been doing this with other people's money, I don't think I've ever lost a client because they were surprised that they lost more. They always know where their risk is, and we always come up with a risk parameters with which they feel comfortable with. That's the power of the option product. Don't get me wrong. I, I love it when a call option, when I own a call and it goes up a lot in value just like anyone else. 
But the true power of this product, the undeniable true power of this product, is how you can customize your overall net worth to give you the risk parameters with which you want customized for your own needs. And that is the strategy block for today. There you go, listeners. That's why I want Uncle Mike handling your assets because that's fun to him. That's his fun. You guys are asleep or doing something fun tonight. Uncle Mike is busy doing options allocation with your portfolios. Meanwhile, we're busy looking ahead, so it's time to keep on rolling and go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, listeners, welcome to Around the Block portion of the show. We tell you what the heck we're keeping an eye on for the rest of this week until we can gather here together again on the program on Thursday. I already touched on a lot of the earnings that are popping off here throughout the week, so a lot to keep keep your eyes on there. I've heard from good authority from our producers that those earnings move reports are hitting new ones, hitting the site as we speak. So head on over to theoptionsinsider.com. If they're not posted, they'll be up there. Shortly, and you could sink your teeth into all that great data. It's all free. You can't, you can't beat the price, listeners. If you want to parse some earnings straddles in a lot of the financials this week or in Delta or maybe City, maybe you want to go, you maybe like fast and all. We don't judge. <laughs> we've, got, we've got all those tickers and a lot more broken down for you over there. Theoptionsinsider.com is the place to go, courtesy of our friends over there in Orat's land as well. Let's go back around the horn and see what everyone else is paying attention to. This week, let's start in the land of lobster. Mr. Lobster, what is on your radar until we gather together here again on Thursday, sir? Oh, oh my gosh, things are filling again. Um, um, what is on my radar? Uh, oh dear, the trade deal. China's no longer a currency manipulator. Could the biggest trade deal in history be going down on the 15th? Uh, I think that's pretty much all anybody is looking at. Uh, so for all you listeners out there, look at all the bids for, you know, junk puts in the vault products. See if those bids pop up. See if, see if new lows are possible. I don't know. But uh, that's certainly – that is on my uh, radar screen, you know, at, literally as I speak. <laughs> well, sounds like it's moving those ticks and vicks your way. The 85,000 lot starting to come your way, sir, slowly but surely, that 85,000. Coming into the old hopper. Uncle Mike, same question for you, sir. While you're busy asset allocating like a madman out there, what is on your radar for the rest of the week? <laughs> it's a madman for sure. Uh, yeah, definitely watching the trade deal. Uh, we have a lot of earnings coming up as well, but I think the trade deal is the main thing. And uh, I am curious to see, uh, well, I, I got to say it again, the ticks and VIX. I think that uh, if we do continue to go, if we do go down with it after the trade deal, uh, it could be uh, more upside for the S&P 500. And for those of us bulls out there, uh, there'll be a whole lot of grinning going on, mostly by me doesn't take much listeners to make uncle mike grin but all-time highs in the indices that'll certainly do it unfortunately that music listeners needs to come to the end of the road at least for this show if you're saying hey i need more don't worry we'll be back shortly if you listen to live just uh, we'll got a brief hiatus while we restructure rejigger the studio here a little bit we'll be back with the crypto rundown in about exactly half an hour going to talk about all the hot things popping off in the world of crypto, those Bitcoin options on CME, yep, they launched today. We're going to get into that. Got a great guest talking about lending for crypto. Not the sexiest thing, but hey, they're lighting it up these days. I also have a trading platform out there as well, so we'll get into all that stuff. BlockFi will be joining us in a little bit. Before we do all that, let's go back around the horn. See what everyone else has up their sleeve that may interest you. Mr. Rock Lobster, I've been hearing for a while now, you got this webinar got this webinar i got this crazy webinar once in a lifetime kind of webinar what the heck is up what are you guys doing over there in the land of the pit and if i want to get access to it where do i go what do i do uh, go over to just the option pit website and uh you will see mark in a pit training looking like uh sign up for the webinar now he's going to teach you the secrets of trading options um and how to trade them in a sustainable way so look go to the webinar it's supposed to be the best webinar Mark has ever done. So, you know, he's a great presenter. So check it out. Check it out. And it's tomorrow at 8 Eastern time. Tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern. Speaking of times, I realize I just misspoke. Five, excuse me, Crypto Rundown will be an hour from now. It will be at 2 p.m. Central. 
We'll be back in about an hour. I have to read your So not a half an hour. I promised. I over-delivered. <laughs> on the top. I was just so excited to get that show out. So we'll be back in about an hour. If you listen to After the Fact, of course, like most of you are, hey, what's it next? On your device, it'll be there waiting for you. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, if I want to get my sink my teeth, really, into that into that fun world of options asset allocation, where should I go? What should I do? StCharlesWealth.com if you're looking for an advisor who is not afraid to bring options into the mix and has uh, logical, reasonable ways with which to use them that, that uh, I like to think makes sense, uh, please contact me, StCharlesWealth.com. You can find my information there. I uh, would love to have a conversation with anybody. He means it. Love a conversation with anybody. I've seen him do it. Listeners, so head on over there. You should be the one. StCharlesWealth.com is the place to go. So you got a hot new webinar coming up in the land of the pit. And you got Uncle Mike and his asset allocation love. You can join him over there at stcharleswealthmanagement.com. Of course, we'll be back in about an hour with all things crypto, a lot popping off over there. And if you want more after that, we'll get more. I think more crypto stuff coming up tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. we got good old OPR hitting the network as always. We're recording on Wednesday, hitting the network on Thursday, and we'll be back again on Thursday for, of course, more of the Option Block. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.